This is Twiss. This Week in Science, episode number 974, recorded on Wednesday, June 12th, 2024, making science popular with vomiting sharks. You're going to love us for this. Hey, everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with baby hands, elephant names, and spatial reframes. But first, thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. From the ever-sunny shores of Ursa Minor Beta to the fanciful fjords of Magathera, not to mention the too-much-perspective vortex of Frogstar World B, space has long been a place that is less than hospitable to human visitors, even without being subjected to Vogon poetry. Astronauts in low-Earth orbit even on short-term space flights, suffer from all sorts of long-term health problems, infections, latent viruses that reactivate, uh, increased skin sensitivity, bone loss, kidney issues, eyesight issues, and more. It is almost as if space does not want us to so much as dip our toes into the vastness of its galactic hot tub, but humans are persistent creatures, never satisfied with having a comfortable place to live, they seek adventure to explore the unknown, no matter how inconvenient, uncomfortable, or physically debilitating the journey may be. And when the going gets too tough, the persistent humans turn to This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries. That happen every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know Science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. It is always so good to get everyone back in the room together for some science conversation. <sighs> I hope everyone had a wonderful week. It has been a doozy. My goodness gracious. Mm -hmm. We have so much science to talk about tonight. I brought a whole bunch of stories related to fun things like Jay Wiss doing what Jay Wiss does best, uh, growing old because of space. Yep, Justin, you and I are on the same the same little uh, little landing pad there, I guess. But um, I don't know. I, yeah, we'll talk about that aging thing later. And I think um, I've got brains and baby hands. Yeah, you know, because that's kind of where I'm at usually. Yeah. What do you have, Justin? I've got uh, bad air in the bayou. Buck research on the space station. Uh, oh, yeah. And then a, a kind of a, an interesting story about supplements. I hope everyone is supplementing their diet with a regular dose of This Week in Science. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh, my goodness. I have just a regular old menagerie this week. I have sharks, I have giraffes, and I have elephants. It sounds like a perfect menagerie, except you're missing the head stabby and invertebrates, but we'll get those some other time. <laughs> Not this week. Yeah. Not this week. All right, everyone. Nice megafauna. <laughs> we got the megafauna. We got the mini fauna. We got the microfauna, but not at all at the same time, maybe. Anyway. This is This Week in Science, and I do need to remind all of you that if you are watching on one of our streaming platforms, we do stream live weekly Wednesday nights around 8 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Facebook when Facebook uh, cooperates because it yeah, does its own things these days. Uh, we are on podcast channels as well, so you can find us on all these different podcasty places. And I have finally, I think, fixed the podcast upload issue with the YouTube podcasts thing. So fingers crossed, if you were doing Google podcasts and now you're doing the YouTube podcasts, you can find the edited podcast version of the show, right? The part that gets the, rid of the before the and the YouTubes? after in the YouTubes. It's the YouTube podcasty oh, things. Yeah. There's so many. There's so many. It's just so, I don't know. It's just a whole thing these days. 
But if you just want to find us and want to know what's going on in the show, head over to twist.org. It's our website, show notes, all those great things, contact info. It's all there. <sighs> Make sure that you share, subscribe, and like. Dun, dun, dun. Ready for the science? Oh, yeah. Let's talk science. Yeah, I'd rather talk science than like weird, shocked groundhogs or hamsters. But all right. J Wist, it's the biggest, baddest telescope in space that takes nice pictures that we like to look at and find out new things about the universe. It's been doing all sorts of cool things ever since it ended up in space, unfurled its nice little solar panels and sensor doohickeys. It's got cameras, infrared sensors, doing all sorts of spectrographic imaging of various uh, elemental ionic components of atmospheres around stars and planets and galaxies. Oh, my! <sighs> Remember, the big thing about JWIST is that unlike Hubble, which is a light-based telescope and can only see things that are emitting light, JWIST can cut through all of the dust, all of the smog, whatever, you know, is in the way. And so researchers have been using it to look further, 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 further back in cosmological time. So this study uh, that's out as of, it's kind of uh, out all over the place uh, in its press releases and archive.org version as of about like a week ago, maybe. Uh, NASA put a, uh, or the paper was published May 31st on archive.org. NASA put out a, a, a comment about it. But this paper is awesome. Uh, it's kind of the paper that's like, hey, um, you know, all those things about that period of time called the reionization re period, that period after the Big Bang where everything was like plasma and it was like, we're going to expand. And we're going all over the place. <sighs> Inflation. Inflation is quite a thing. Yeah. Um, the reionization period lasted about the first billion years of the universe. Hubble couldn't see past that first billion years. So for a very long time, we were like, no, oh, nothing, nothing before that first billion years. And we've been getting further and further back, especially with J-WIST. And this particular yeah, well, well, one paper, of the One of the ways that we've like also been handling this is like, well, the universe is just older. The universe we, is just older than we thought. Eh, yeah. we'll, we'll add a billion years here, another half a billion when we need it. It seems like it's older because we can still see back. The idea is we couldn't see back further than what you're saying. There's a billion year mm -hmm. period, right? So if we could see further back, that meant the universe was just older and uh, that happened earlier. That's how we've been how we've been aging our how universe. we have <laughs> aging yet again. Um, well, now... We can see clearly now that J-WIST is turned on, and this study is awesome. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of authors, and it is called The First Billion Years, According to J-WIST. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, they have taken a really, really good look at a couple of early galaxies. Things that they were like, mm, not really sure what's going on with the redshift there. Can't tell whether it's like closer or further or what's happening. And now they're like, oh, well, yeah. So um, this one galaxy, it turns out that it's actually from 300 million years after the Big Bang. I'm going to uh -oh. say that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that again. Uh -oh. What? That's 700 million years before there was supposed to be an entire galaxy formed. <laughs> mm hmm Right. So we've going, we're going back and back and back. So there was this reionization, re so the plasma turning into hydrogen, helium, actual ions, and then clumping together and starting to turn into dust and gas and things that weren't just energy, hot, hot plasma. Uh, and yeah, well, apparently J-WIST can see through time and has taken us back to a period when oxygen and even carbon dioxide and 
uh, or carbon at least were beginning to form in the early universe. And this galaxy that a, an experiment called the JWIST Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey, JADES or JADES or JADED team, uh, which is co-led by UC Santa Cruz astronomer Brant Robertson, uh, they've put out a whole bunch of different studies, really. And this is just uh, one of the many studies in addition to the uh, the paper in archive.org <laughs> that is basically rewriting textbooks. And they say, with stunning clarity, JWIST has revealed the universe's first billion years. The scientific community is analyzing a wealth of JWIST imaging and spectroscopic data from that era and in the process of rewriting astronomy textbooks. So what they've done with this imaging is they've gone back and because of the fact that uh, JWIST can see in through the dust and sees heat signatures, but also that's that energy is still, is it traveling toward us? Is it traveling away from us? Is it in that ex in inflation expansion period? So they're looking at redshift in this galaxy and they were, and that's how they were able to compare it to other galaxies and really be able to say, uh, we think that this is from the first 300 million years of our universe. So 300 million years after the Big Bang, there were galaxies. And they said, what they used to think is that a lot of these big galaxies, bright lights were like, oh, they're just like around a black hole and the black holes doing this thing. And the light we're seeing is a quasar. These were stars. It's the brightest thing hmm. that, that they've seen. It, the, it's the most distant, brightest thing. And they think that it was just full of stars, hundreds of times brighter than our own sun. Oxygen was present 300 million years during this reionization period. They think now also that during this reionization period that the uh, light that was being seen, that these, these galaxies were forming like in little tiny pockets and clusters. So the image images that we see of the night sky, it's like da, 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 stars in the sky, not all stars, sometimes they're galaxies. And, um, but that's not really what happened. There were these weird bubbles of condensation or of clumping of matter that fell into, and the rest was still plasma or still reionizing. And so that early differentiation of little galaxies or big galaxies, it kind of set the stage for all of the filaments that we see connecting the various parts of the, the universe today with our various, uh, our various eyes on the sky. It's pretty good. Hey, yeah. Yeah, anyway, I think it's pretty cool. Um, they get to look at lots of things a long time ago. Um, not <laughs> quasars. Yeah. This is, I mean, this isn't the last time this telescope's going to rewrite textbooks, I think. We're going we're gonna yeah. to get lots of really wild information. I think that is, you know... For me, though, it's just like, okay, I'm trying, how, wait, this goes against everything. Like, how, well, how, I know, well, how were there these, these you, larger molecules? You, how were there the big stars? How were there this much light? You what was say goes I don't, against everything. You have I to have understand that. I have ever learned. Yes. I know however, nothing. However, much of what you have learned, <laughs> much of what you have learned was based on. Uh, Assumptions. Mathematical models being run backwards in time without any uh, data along the way to go. Yeah, that's right. That's a hit. That's a hit. That's a, oh wait, now you're missing. So mm -hmm. so this is we we have figured out much of how this universe uh, came to be by back engineering the limited data sets that we had with mm -hmm. telescopes yeah. and understanding of physics, and now we have online paper without computers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with no AI, just human intelligence and captured knowledge and education and applied uh, reasoning. So all of these things, when we when we're getting into the the, the rewriting of the textbooks, it's because a lot of textbook in this portion was sort of placeholder. 
for when we get more information, mm -hmm. uh, we'll fill in the details. But we'll say there was like a billion years. It's kind of a, just in itself is a, you know, this happened over a billion years. Uh, like, that's also not very specific, right? So... Yeah. But but this being a, so there's a, there's a question though, you know, being able to look back in time and gauge what is time. Our candles are only as accurate as we can measure. Our estimate of uh c, the gravity, you know, the gravitational constant e equals mc squared is just as good as we can estimate from the all speed of light. The speed of light or speed of light, yeah, not gravitational constant, sorry. Yes, speed of light. Um <sighs> And there, yeah. And what if, what if some of these, these telescopes, like where we use gravitational lensing to allow us to see past one galaxy in a time to another galaxy behind it and further, further back in time, like a, like, a, like a microscope or a telescope, you know, using yeah. lenses, gravitational yeah. lenses. Um, what if though it's a hall of mirrors? What if they mm -hmm, shift mm -hmm. the light and bend it? And what if it isn't always just the way we think it is? Um, and so is it coming back at us? And we're like, oh, it's 300 million years before or after the, the Big Bang. But what if it's like, you know, a neighbor? We just aren't looking at it right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So either our estimation of the age of the universe is incorrect or our understanding of how fast things happen is incorrect. Or we're not measuring what we thought we're measuring. Uh, yeah, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thanks, Jay Wist, for throwing everything into wonderful question. I love oh yeah, it. and I'm I'm actually impressed because this is one of those things that I, I've always had in that category of, but we'll never really know. It, it, there's no way to see. There's no way to capture data from yeah. the distant, distant past uh, like this. And of course, uh, there is. And that's what cosmology is doing. That's what JWIST is doing right now. It's looking into a distant, distant, distant past and collecting data from it. And that is mm -hmm. amazing that we have even this ability to capture this data. So Even good. if it is from the backside of the universe spun around a black hole, twisted around a gravitational lensing of a galaxy and sent back to us, Still very fascinating. So it is fascinating. And, you know, but we have to trust it doesn't the researchers. It yeah. Well, sorry. Okay. And regardless of where it is, it doesn't actually change the age of it. Because even if that even if that galaxy was snapshotting behind us, mm -hmm. was uh, eight billion years uh, in the distance behind us, and it went and got zipped around and then came back to us, it's still all of that Light. distance tells the story of its time. Yeah. Whatever its time is. It means it would have to have been there for all of the time it took. Right? So. I need a uh, certificate. Um, so, even, so, yeah, even if, <laughs> even if it's not where we th think it is in the, the regionally physical-ish uh, relationship thing, the time element of that light traveling uh, is unalterable, uh, regardless of the path it took to get back to, to J-List, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. The light, so at you least. Think. So you think. Until we remember oh, what's on so, that. Okay. Okay. We're going to go too long. Blair has to go to bed. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but we, that's like, our first story. I know. It's amazing. And How I is she going to bed already? Awesome stuff because the <laughs> clock still ticks here on earth for people who have babies and have to get up in the morning. So, uh, Justin, um, you know, all of this stuff with space and time and that, you know, most of us have to just trust the word of the scientists on the data and what they're doing. Yeah. And it's like, okay, cosmos wonder, ah, yay. Um, that doesn't really change much for most of us on the planet on a daily basis, but uh, nutritional supplements do. So this is an interesting one. This is uh, University of Guelph, I think it's, it is in Canada has come to the damning conclusion about one of its own botanists, Stephen Newmaster, which uh, a panel of investigators has found with high probability that the scientists engaged in data fabrication and falsification, failed to acknowledge sources of data, mismanaged conflicts of interest in at least three papers. Uh, there were also, also... So that's why you said his first and last name. You really <laughs> want to put him on blast. <laughs> well, you know why? You know why? Because... 
the University of Guelph is such a odd Really, uh, sounding and looking word that I'm like I I'm 100 percent sure that I read a paper from them based on a oh. nutritional supplement that I wanted to take and I was like it had something to do with memory and I took it and I can't remember what it was called so <laughs> obviously yeah. it didn't work <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah I might be a little bit like uh, hey I think I've relied on reading one of these papers uh, they said yeah there was numerous false uh, or, or unsupportable statements that showed a disrespect for science communication. 2013 Newsmaster and colleagues had used DNA barcoding, a method to identify uh, species of tiny segments of genetic material, to verify ingredients in echinacea, ginkgo biloba, and other uh, supplements. Biloba? Ginkgo biloba. <laughs> biloba. It's biloba. the sticky tree. There's a bunch <laughs> of them in whole bunch of things. That, so, so these are substances that are supposed, supposed to have the health benefits that they're looking into. They published this paper that was, found that many supplements lacked ingredients listed on their labels and that toxic mm. contaminants uh, tainted some others. So this was, this was don't trust your supplements. They're lying to you. Things were pulled from shelves. Uh, there was a whole shakeup of the supplement industry, which was probably not completely undeserved because this is not the only look that's been uh, done on what's in supplements. However, this was such a big deal that a lot of the supplement companies began spending a lot of money quality testing the supplements. So that you know, then you're like, okay, well, even if this paper was terrible and the scientists did awful things, hey, how come they weren't testing them before, you know? So now a lot of these major supplement companies are sending their ingredients for testing to make sure they have what they say they mm. have. Thing that is... This like something that should be federally regulated, don't you think? You're not because they're mm -hmm. supplements still. Yeah, yeah. Thing is, dun, dun, thing dun. is you know where they sent drugs. those things to get tested? University of Delaware. <laughs> no, they sent them to a private company that was created by one Stephen Newmaster. What? Botanist at Guelph University in Canada, who apparently had set up several supplement testing facilities privately in a private corporation. Uh, uh oh. Uh, there he before, is. Before publishing uh, on the potentially fabricated, or I guess it's now been substantiatedly fabricated data. Uh, that there were problems. In Everyone that. boo this man. It's, boo. Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, I don't know. Google tamped it down like in the old days where people would make like their web rings or whatever. It's like, I'm going to link to you and you're going to link to me. We're going to make, you know, and then like people were like, I'm going to spend a week and I'm going to build 3,000 websites and they're all going to link to each other and I'm going to rank in Google and I will make money. Um, yeah, there was eight experts in, a, in DNA barcoding and related fields that accused the master of scientific misconduct, uh, identifying data essential to their his landmark papers that were missing, fraudulent, or plagiarized. Ooh, plagiarized, uh, additionally? One of, yeah, another investigation found evidence of a broader pattern of fabrication and data manipulation in speeches, teaching, biographical statements uh, over two decades also suggested that newsmaster or new master embellished or simply invented findings or accomplishments and claimed credit for work done by other scientists one of the testing companies that he created because there was multiple apparently true id is now defunct Although uh, many supplement makers are still carrying the mark of certification from this <laughs> no longer existing. Uh, of course. Nature's Way. That one's like super, that, that one's all over the place. You see them on yes, the, uh, uh, you see them probably the got some of my supplements around here. And, yeah. and read the papers and looked look at the things. Oh gosh, I have we to go try look to do at all our own homework now. <laughs> if you can't, uh, trust the scientists, uh, then there's nobody left. So, uh, anyway. This is why scientists are doing a lot of work to make open science a thing, to make open science communication a thing, to create large databases, to uh, pre-publish their 
the research methods so that they can get approved before the studies happen. So it's kind of like the scientific community, you know, there's this question now like, oh, universities and science can't police itself. But, you know, everywhere you go, there are going to be people gaming the game, right? There are going to be people who are taking advantage of the system, right? Oh, there's a system. I'm smarter than that. I can do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's so, what it sounds so, like. Know, this, this person got caught, and it's going to imp- it's going to impact he, people. Yeah, he found he supplement. found uh, an an opportunity, and, he, and you know the thing is too. It's like, oh gosh, so you can have a scientist who is out there uh, wanting to find a nutritional supplement that does uh, solve a problem for humanity, and then you have somebody who's putting out a supplement who's saying it solves a problem just to make money. And then if the scientist doesn't ever find a thing that does a thing, uh, finds is like, well, well maybe, how else can I make a living based off of all of this? Well, I could be testing the things that other people are saying to see if it's right. But then in this case, that also didn't work, apparently. Couldn't figure out how to do that right. I'll just make it up. I'll just say it. Like, you, you, end up, uh, you end up in no better, no worse off than the other grifters. So, right, there needs to be a, a way that people can do oversight. And, and what are we saying, Blair, at the beginning of this? Something about uh, there's no federal. Maybe there should be like a federal oversight of some sort. Yeah, it's just so strange things. to me that's, well, it's not food and it's you not still, drugs. But you still take it into so it's it nothing. In the body. It's you money. It in it's body. money in a capsule form. <laughs> yeah, what do you ingest that isn't food and isn't drugs? Like, yeah. Yeah. Crayons? Supplements. This, this is it, right? Like, this is, yeah. How are they in this? How have they lasted in this no man's land as long as they have? How is there Money. not some? Sort of, well, yeah, of course. So, Capitalism. Got it. <laughs> so one of the things, though, like you, you hit on it earlier, Justin, is the idea that there are some researchers really doing real work to figure out how these compounds that are found in foods that we eat or that are parts of plants and other stuff that we've been using historically going back a long time. So turmeric, right? Or turmeric um, is well known to have anti-inflammatory effects. And it, the amount though is, you know, a lot of these things is like, well, you got to really got to take a lot to actually have an impact. Um, yeah. And so the question is this, with supplements, how much is enough? Which ones actually work? Um, which ones don't? I mean, everybody's like Paul Stamets, mushrooms forever, um, which may be true, but Wait, we what? See, I don't know. Like that. Lion's mane and like all those other things. Anyway. Oh, I take probably, that all the time. You know, actually, you maybe taking, that's the one. Maybe that's were, the one I looked up. If you're taking something as a drug to supplement your physiology that might actually have negative interactions with real with other things and drugs you know it's like oh you shouldn't eat grapefruit because you did that you know whatever it's <sighs> yeah the regulation well, I, I think about, like, needs to happen people people who don't take any supplements normally get told to take supplements when they're pregnant and when they're breastfeeding it's part of the deal and doctors who will otherwise say you don't need supplements, you can get what you need from you, what you eat. This is the exception, right? This is not only did I need that, but I needed iron when I was pregnant. Well, and, because your child is going to steal it from your body. Right. Oh, no, I get that. I had to take calcium and I to take all sorts of things. But like, do you want osteoporosis or do you want a healthy child? <laughs> that stuff that you're taking is what it says it is. And whether it has any contaminants in it, which like, I don't know, kind of a delicate time to suddenly be taking something full of contaminants. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, that supplement that you took has never been tested and has arsenic and heavy metals. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Terrible. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. Yay. Yeah. It's not a a great relief to know that the labs that have been looking into this are from a, a researcher who was fabricating his initial look to say that there was a problem. Like it's a, I get this, I get the little capitalistic vicious cycle that they created, but yeah, I just want to say still don't know anything. any doctor on the internet who has advertisements and says, buy my supplements. 
don't. And don't yeah. like, red flags. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. a reason we haven't ever sold Dr. Justin's not a real doctor poop pills. Wait. <laughs> so I'm not saying we've never sold it, but uh, it's not, a, it wasn't as big of an industry as I thought it would be. Not on my website, mm. at least. Anyway. No, no. People have to DM me. I'll be in the back. It's better than <laughs> Blair. Let's move on. I think Black I'm gonna vomit. Thing. Yeah, that makes me want to barf. Um, so uh, pretty simple story. You know, shark vomits echidna. Tale as old as time. What? Why? It's, I I mean, this is like a very silly anecdotal thing, but this is a group of Australian scientists. They were doing an ocean research trip. And they were measuring tiger sharks. And one barfed up a whole echidna. Okay, so I just want to go, okay. Let me put it on screen right now. Um, yes. There's a shark, which lives in the water. Mm -hmm. And yes. is like looks like a shark. I mean, mm -hmm. big mouth and lots of teeth and everything, but you know, yes, tiger shark, one of the more dangerous sharks for sure. Yeah. And tiger shark and, uh, can do, bite open a turtle. Yeah. They do tend to come closer to shore sometimes when they're feeding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got tiger shark. Um, and then the idea of echidna. Echidna is like mm -hmm. a weird marsupial Australian porcupine. So um, they are a monotreme. So monotreme. they're an egg-laying mammal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And and yes, and they look like a porcupine with a long pointy nose. But those are spines. Um, they're not related to porcupines, right? But they're covered in spines. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things here. Yeah, they're not uh, aquatic animals. <laughs> so this is nope. something that's kind of um, not been observed by researchers at least in in the past so they were from james cook university they were tagging sharks and this three meter or aka oh, let's say nine foot tiger shark just they were they were tagging it and it just barfed an entire echidna up just a whole, whole one so it was whole enough still that it was definitely a recent snack <laughs> The lead researcher, uh, Nicholas Lubitz, says, when it spat it out, I looked at it and remarked, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so they figured it out. It was an echidna. Very strange. There's really only a couple of explanations for this. Um, they're only found in Australia and New Guinea. They Tiger sharks eat pretty much anything. And so their best guess is that either the echidna was swimming in the shallows and a tiger shark ate it, or it was traveling between islands, which sometimes they do do. So they swim a little bit. Uh, I think option three is fell in. Just to, you know, throwing that out there. Um, from what I've seen of it, Or echidnas, maybe it was... Crazy. Yeah, maybe it was foraging <laughs> near the water. I don't know. Absolutely, could have been. Um, near the so, water. Anyway, how do the sharks don't jump out of the water and grab something, to go back in? Do they? No, this, I this, saw shark this buddy would have had to they get <laughs> into the water in some way. So mm -hmm. either intentionally or unintentionally, an echidna took a dip and became snack. Um, the, the researchers say. I think it just must have felt funny in his throat because the tiger shark was unharmed by the spines and they followed it with a tracker for a while afterwards. Totally fine. So just very strange food web dynamic happening here that I never really would have thought about. Um, also, Wait. the tiger shark was very lucky it wasn't a porcupine because porcupine quills are barbed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There was a there was a another story that was out there this week about uh, one of the uh, a shark that washed up on a beach in Australia that had had just eaten a dolphin. You could see it had an undigested dolphin in it. 
Wow. And, and and they think the uh, but it was missing its liver that looked like an orca attack. So right after making a kill on the dolphin, <laughs> the shark got got eaten. Man, that's by like an orca. in the this Star is Wars web. and a menace when they say there's always a bigger fish. <laughs> it's always an orca. Is at, yeah, the, you know, at the top the of that list. Always Somebody knows orca. what I'm talking about. Anyway. Um. Yeah. So, tiger shark ate an echidna. That's and all. now, That's and now story. I know that ech- echidnas swim, which I didn't know before. I wouldn't have think they thought about that. Or, and... the, or we know that sharks can come out on land and no, chase no. not the not those sharks, not tigers. What it does sharks. remind us is that sharks can be uh, 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 generalists, and that when the food is there, they will eat it or try to. Yes. And especially maybe... tiger sharks, they'll eat anything. I will not. I like lots of things, but I will not eat everything. Um, yeah, and that probably doesn't taste very good. Yeah, and I don't really like uh, astronaut ice cream either. It's just not as yummy as you really think it's going to be. I don't know how astronauts do it, um, but a whole bunch of studies came out this week related to astronauts and how space makes them old. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the studies wasn't actually on astronauts, but it used the murine model, which means mice that went to space, Mm. to look at markers related to frailty. Frailty is a a syndrome that occurs in certain individuals as they age. It's usually a marker of rapid aging and uh, getting closer to the senescent period of your life. Um, So the researchers uh, in this particular study looking at aging and putative frailty biomarkers being altered by space flight. Uh, they looked at these this data from mice from NASA's gene lab astro- and NASA astronaut data from JAXA and the Isp- inspirations for missions. And they were able to identify changes in gene expression and the patterns of that expression and uh, how it might be indicative of conditions that are kind of like frailty in space because you're not being pulled down by gravity and constantly having to fight against it and that the activity and the no oh, gravity gravity the mass everything that we do here on our planet uh it keeps us alive because <laughs> we're fighting constantly against it and when you go to space you're not fighting anymore you're floating free to be you and me um These researchers uh, have determined, however, that these hazards of human space flight are uh, multiple. And in their work, they have identified these as being, as I open it up to bring it to the the stage, we've got space radiation, altered microgravity, isolation and confinement. Yeah, that's one. Distance from Earth and hostile closed environments as opposed to isolated. Anyway. These lead to cardiovascular deconditioning, which is not good for your your life. Renal stone formation, so uh, that gives you kidney issues. Muscle atrophy, that's the frailty thing. Space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, which we have talked about before because it's kind of like, you know, businessmen, they put their ties on too tight and it can lead to um, glaucoma earlier in life. It's kind of a different but weird, interesting, uh, similar thing where... um, the optical disc become uh, gains edema because gravity is not pulling the fluids through your body in the same way that it had before. And so nerves get af- affected and the whole eyes become affected. Um, sensory motor, vestibular function, weakened skeletal function. So um, osteopenia, which is a precursor to uh, osteo... Porosis? Porosis. Osteopenia is kind of a... Osteopenia is actually a make it up term. It's a research yeah. term that means before you have osteoporosis. But if so you can catch osteopenia, then maybe you can stop osteoporosis. So it's Yeah, good. and then Merck came out with a uh, diagnosis of osteopenia and started giving people drugs for it, even though they don't have a condition yet that requires it. It's a whole thing, but yeah, yeah. it's a separate thing. Yeah. Anyway, sarcopenia, it's a lot of things that come from that that are involved in aging. And so, um, 
really going to space, it's very similar pathophysiology, which is really like the the mechanisms that your body goes through to ward uh, disease pathos. Uh, so going to space so far, not seen as really great. Uh, in the other study, they did direct RNA resequencing of astronaut blood, and they found a whole bunch of uh, markers, some of them that uh, they're looking at uh, RNA, and they found what they call M to the sixth A methylation profiles. And these levels changed post-flight, uh, indicating uh, a stress and a change in the the uh, transcriptional responses within the blood and the ability to uh, move oxygen around and all the aspects of, you know, making, making good, happy body healthy. Um, but they were able to see a lot of pathways with what they call the most differentially methylated genes. And within these, it's a uh, Fusion sustained in monocytes. So monocytes are uh, cells involved in the immune response. Nitric oxide, that is also involved in metabolic responses. Skin tumors, um, pathways related to oxygen take up and release of carbon dioxide by erythrocytes, which that doesn't sound great. You kind of want those to work. Um, but they found a whole bunch of methylated sites. Methylation is basically genetic stuff that happens because life and RNA. Yay, RNA. It is the, hey, your body's working awesome signal, except it's uh, also now being used as a marker for, oh no, d d d you don't want that to happen um, because, yeah, anyway. Uh, but it's great. Don't go to space. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> You had another story, but not astronaut oldness. What did you want to? It talk? actually is. Uh, this is. Uh, I, th I think there must have been a, a series somewhere. No, it's a series the... of papers that all came out in in uh, Nature Open Access this yeah. last week. Yeah. yeah, this is another one. This one's from Bucks Institute for Research on Aging. Aging. Yep. Uh, but what they looked into is uh, sp more specifically, they were focused on the immune system. And they were mapping out how microgravity affects immune cells at a single cell level. So astronauts in low Earth orbit, all the things you were just saying. One of the ones I think wasn't in that list, though, was the latent virus reactivation. Wait, what? Thing. Yeah. <laughs> you have a virus that is being contained that becomes reactivated. So... There's a drop in normal immune function that, that takes place that could also be related to a lot of the other things that we see. Mm -hmm. The researchers in this case used cells in simulated microgravity along with uh, some astronaut data. So to simulate the environment of almost no gravity, the team grew cells inside of a rotating wall vessel which is a device that was developed by NASA to simulate microgravity environments. So they run cells through this rotational device that's uh, simulating the microgravity, look at the cells, collect data, and yes, they have changed. The shape of the cells seems to be a little bit different. And how do we know that this is the same type of changes taking place in space? The team then uh, took their data and validated the findings by comparing it to the data with the other space studies like we've been talking about already. JAXA, Cell-Free, Epigenome Study, Mission SpaceX's Inspiration4 mission, NASA's twin study was uh, in there, and spleens from mice housed on the International Space Station. The study found changes in gravitational force altered the way the cells function all the way down to the cellular level, not just uh, something else that they interact with, but within the cells. The study found parallels between immune cell changes in space and those occurring with aging on Earth, which is what the Buck Institute Research Center uh, normally is studying. Focusing on several genes and biochemical pathways that are affected by the microgravity, the Buck team turned to a machine learning program that was able to detect uh, more than 2 million interactions between genes and different drugs and foods, and they identified dozens of potential compounds that could have uh, beneficial effects on 
on this. They chose just one to test. The, the hmm. plant pigment uh, quercetin. Oh, this is that's in, that, it's in walnuts. And red onions and grapes mm-hmm. and berries and apples and citrus fruits. <clears throat> and uh, the reason they picked this one to explore further is not necessarily that the algorithm that they used ranked it any higher than the other compounds that they were finding that could have a, an interaction in this. But it's, it's because it was already a widely available antioxidant, anti-aging supplement. So yep. in testing. Again, Christine, supplement, people have been taking it for a while. Yeah. Or you eat walnuts. <laughs> they, they, uh, according to them, it uh, re- was able to reverse approximately 70% of the changes caused by lack of gravity and protected cells from reactive oxygen excesses. So uh, we now have a supplement for astronauts. Ta-da! Who ran this study? Was it my guy, Steve? <sighs> well, this okay. is what's, we got to backtrack now because now we're like, okay. Well, wait a second. We just had a, a thing. Uh, but the Buck Institute for Research on Aging is normally, you know, they can't we find really nothing and supplement. still get funding, right? Like, they got to, like, be. <laughs> so there's, is it a conflict? Do they have connections to supplement companies? This is, like, all the sort of questions that, of course, you would want to ask secondarily. Mm-hmm. Um but I, I think that uh, when you are doing research in this environment, uh, using NASA data, sending it out, talk, you know, you're not doing it in a corner of the research world where you can say this is a Canadian study uh, from Guelph University, say, just to pick one, uh, that can just be used by a nutritional company to point to. Not you yet. would be throwing yourself out there into the realm of NASA trying to protect its astronauts. Mm-hmm. So I have a feeling they've been vetted. Yeah. But I, I haven't dug any further. I could be totally wrong. I, yeah. I, I mean, everything we need to look at. I like the fact, though, that this is a series of or a, a an issue with several studies released all together because what it does yeah. is it it shows that Okay, even though this one paper showed this one thing, this other paper shows this thing which overlaps. And so it allows for the, uh, I guess, the synthesis of all of that data or all of the information to kind of go, okay, this seems to be going in this direction, that goes in that direction. Where is the next step for the research? So, yeah. And, you know, especially because one of the, the their findings show, showed that uh, lymphocytes, monocytes, these are key immune cells, but these are also mm-hmm. like uh, uh, cells within the system of uh, the blood uh, system, blood creation that are then transferring this oxygen that we find is missing from other parts of the body and organs and is causing issues. So, so it does seem like there, it, there can be a, uh, what is uh, missing the word right now, but a uh, mechanical uh, aspect, you know, to these uh, the conditions in space on cellular levels that is causing perhaps different gene expressions, that is causing different functions or interactions that is that is limiting or altering the normal bodily function. And so it, it could be that all of these things that are connected, are are <laughs> that see uh, all these studies that you're saying of oh, that overlap there may be solutions for a problem in one study that was identified within yeah. another study that identified things that are be, that, that they see being different so with all of them together yeah that that combined picture of multiple research angles and multiple research directions and disciplines can potentially create uh, the solutions that would allow human beings to be in orbit longer, healthier? Hopefully. I mean, if that's where we want to go, we want to do it as healthily as we can. Um, or know that if you're going that way, you're not coming back or your offspring are not coming back or whatever. You know, one it, way to the moon, Alice. Um, and if we can do it up there, and if we can do it up there, we can do it down here too. We can do it anywhere. Yes. Yes. <sighs> This is This Week in Science, making it happen, talking about the science that other people made happen. We are bringing you, like we do every Wednesday, all the things that we thought were cool to talk about. And we're asking questions about it, digging into it, you know, adding our little hints of questions and uh, 
ponderings about where this, where it's all going and how it's going to work. We do hope that you love the show and enjoy the way that we present these questions and this research. So if you do, please hit the like, subscribe, and the share buttons all at once. Tell your friends, subscribe to Twist right now. Let them know. Text your friend. You, this is a really great thing. You should be watching it right now. You should subscribe, eh? Um, you know, go to Reddit, to the podcast's subreddit, and answer some questions there. And just toss This Week in Science in there for whatever the answer is. You know, what's your favorite podcast, This Week in Science? What podcast make you, made you feel things, This Week in Science? Um how did, did, is there a podcast that changed your life this week in science? Like, please go do that on the subreddit. I think that would be really awesome because I'm seeing too many of like what we're not on there and it would be nice to get our name in there. And additionally, head over to Patreon or not Patreon, twist.org and you can click on the Zazzle link so you can get all sorts of merchandise like this awesome sweatshirt with some art on it that Blair drew. There's a calendar if you still need to know what's going on for the next six months that Blair made. It's up there as well. And there's all sorts of other cool stuff. Help support us by buying our merchandise or click on the Patreon button and support us in an ongoing fashion month by month. Choose your level of support and well, thank you by air, by air. No, I will breathe air as I thank you by name at the end of the show. And there's some nice little gifts for you as well for the $10 and more per month uh, sponsors. But any amount really helps. Whatever you can do, just thank you. Your support means everything. We can't do it without you. Thank you. We are going to come on back right now for that section of the show that we haven't had regularly for a while, but we do know and love so much on This Week in Science. It is time for Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. What you got, Blair, other than yawns? I <laughs> couldn't help it. Uh, I have a story about giraffes, and I'm very excited to bring this story because when I was in college getting my zoology degree, um, I had already worked at the zoo for a while, and I showed up in my vertebrate biology class thinking I knew what was up. And you always know what's the, up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're young. Well, we know you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. And one of and my professor at one point said, like, who knows why a giraffe has a long neck? And I was like, that's easy. So they can reach the leaves up there, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, wrong. What? <laughs> nope. It's a sexually selected trait because the males use their necks to fight. And how do we know that? It's because if you look at which leaves giraffes eat, they don't eat the leaves that they could reach at the highest heights. They eat from like here. So wait, wait, wait. they're not they're not stretching to reach the shelf that's over the refrigerator or the one with the Exactly. Uh, yeah, okay. So if, if yes, imagine if you were seven feet tall and everyone's like, oh, that's easy. They're seven feet tall so they can reach the top of the fridge, but you're always eating out of the cheese drawer. That can't be why, right? So no, it's it's because you love the cheese. So this blew my mind. And then I spent the last, I don't know, 20 years telling people that giraffes were tall because they fight with their necks and they it's called like neck sparring and they bang their necks together and it's this very intense competition for mates but if they're but if they're eating yes. the ones that are neck high already uh -huh. doesn't that mean uh -huh. that that's how tall they needed to be to eat those so here's the thing like they if, already did the stretching if they needed only to get to these things that are here why did evolutionary pressure push them past the area that they were trying to reach. It doesn't make sense. The giraffes that expended less energy making a less tall neck would benefit from having leftover energy. And they don't exist. Right. 
that's the problem <laughs> is that there has to be some additional selection selective pressure yeah. that's making them go taller right now now here's the study that i brought this week from pennsylvania state university okay they looked at hundreds thousands many 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 photos of giraffes in captivity in the wild the ones in captivity they knew exactly how old they were the ones in the wild they only looked at adults since they couldn't guess exactly how old they are and they looked at how long their necks are how long their legs are and the ratio of leg height to body and neck height to body and this is important because <laughs> much like with human healthcare studies <laughs> We've been spending all this time looking at the male giraffes and haven't really asked ourselves about the female giraffes. Oh, no. Okay. So what they found was, yes, male giraffes are taller and therefore they have longer necks than females, which supports the necks for sex hypothesis, which is that their long neck helps them compete and therefore get their prize right um but when they looked at this they noticed that on the whole males are taller they are 30 to 40 percent bigger than females duh right <laughs> but where this gets interesting oh, is oh, so so wait 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 yes. i think i got it i think i got it yes. that means that the females necks are just the right height to reach those uh higher leaves that is a great guess but you see justin every giraffe regardless of how tall they are according to this one study from when i was in college is the big asterisk here. <laughs> yeah. they eat at this level so even, the, even if the i'm seven females. feet tall i'm reaching to the five foot mark if i'm six feet tall i'm reaching to the four foot mark well, blair awesome. yes yes you worked at a zoo two zoos yes. multiple zoos yes like yes did you see giraffes stretch and reach to the top of trees to eat things? Like, what did you see? Did you watch the they giraffes? Would, they would, but they would give up so easily. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they just, like, play with the tall stuff with their tongues a little bit and be like, meh, it's not worth it. Too much no. effort. <laughs> Too much. Oh Absolutely. Gosh. This is, you could see there was, there was all of the trees in the exhibits have a very clear line at which they've given up. And a lot of them are like at or like below their heads. Like they could definitely reach higher. So anyway, right, but she's so the point of okay. the other creatures, right? Yeah. So the, the so, point of the study, let me get back yeah. to this actual it's study totally. from this week in science. So um, the males are 30 to 40% bigger than females. When you adjust the height of their neck or the length of their legs for overall body size, males don't have bigger necks than females. They don't. In fact, it's the other way. Females have bigger necks than males when you adjust what? for body size. Males are taller. They so, have longer legs and the females have the longer necks. So it's so if you measured a male neck to a female neck, the male neck would still be larger. But if you measured the neck in relation to body size, mm -hmm. the percentage mm -hmm. of the height that is neck mm -hmm. is more on a female. So that means... These females are putting this energy and there is this selective pressure for a relatively longer neck than males. What do females have to do that males don't have to do? Have babies? Create whole babies and then yeah. feed them with milk because giraffes are mammals. So the new theory now is back to the old theory that this is all about gaining resources. So here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> we've said the giraffes are to get food then we're like nah it's for sex then we're like nah it's for food how about it's for both like how i foresee this happening mm -hmm. is that there was selective pressure to get higher leaves yeah. and that resulted in bigger longer necks due to selective pressure and then once you had those necks males started neck sparring and yeah. therefore the bigger, chunkier necks did better. 
Yep. Similarly, I think, I think that sounds the female cool. necks, right? Yeah, like they they got more and more nutrients the taller their necks were. Therefore, they fared better. There still kind of has to be an inciting incident to create this kind of runaway evolutionary tree that turned a cow into this, basically. Right. <laughs> so, 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 it's and then one of the other things that, that sort of le left out of this is the selective pressure, which which could be. Uh, just there's more leaves available higher and therefore there was more resource. Or it could also be that there were other grazers, other tree grazers that could reach up to a certain level that were competition. And mm -hmm. if you're not a fighting creature that's going to fight off other animals and uh, scare them away, then just being able to reach a little higher than them gives you a whole, uh, your uh, nutritional biome is preserved there out of the reach of uh, say, I don't know, elephants or whatever else is is reaching up and grabbing things. Uh, now you have this whole other area. So it could also be a selective pressure from other uh, tree grazers. Yes. Yes. The, the other thing that I think is so important to mention here, because it's all based on like perspective taking, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a quote from, um, the one of the lead researchers whose name is Mr. Giraffe Man. Doug Kavener. So I Doug Kavener says, um, rather than stretching out to eat leaves on the tallest branches, you often see giraffes, especially females, reaching deep into the trees. So we're talking about the cheese drawer, right? Giraffes are picky eaters. They eat the leaves of only a few tree species and longer necks allow them to reach deeper into the trees to get leaves no one else can. Once females reach four or five years of age, they're almost always pregnant and lactating. So we think the increased nutritional demand of females drove the evolution of giraffes long necks. And nobody has ever said that to me before, that this could be about getting deeper in the trees as opposed to higher up in the trees. and that mm -hmm. makes so much sense. Yeah, you can get your hands deeper but, into the cheese drawer to find the really good aged cheese. And it's, well, it's, it's going to be about high, just in, like the competition that you're talking about. Like you yeah. could have giant horns that prevent you from going deeper into the tree, right? Right. And and it is it is also going to be taller because the one thing that people seem to uh, never get past is the giraffe's long neck. They also have very long legs. Yeah, like the, mm -hmm. their height is is uh, being resource uh, is is from two different uh, aspects of their anatomy. Uh, it sort of reminds me of uh, the T Rex. Why is the T Rex's arms so short? Well, it's not because they are short. It's because their legs got really big over evolution. Uh -huh. Their arms just didn't, and their head got and, huge, and, and their head got huge. Counterbalance. Yeah. But, right, but but they actually their arms they didn't shrink. They just never grew because they weren't prioritized. This is prioritized legs and neck. So if you're trying to take height out of the equation, you have two things that you must overcome, and all your work right. will be ahead of you. Right. I think the the thing about the neck though is that you can have long legs, and it it's disgusting to imagine a giraffe with long legs and not a long neck for some reason, but you could have long legs and not have a long neck. The neck actually is a huge issue for the giraffe because they have to pump blood up to the brain and yeah. their heart has to work so hard to do that. So it would benefit them if they could gain height any other way, which is why you have to think of a function specifically for this neck. Right. But so I just appreciate that this is kind of like, we're going back to the original hypothesis in some ways with this story, but they, they kind of throw some new elements into the equation that I really appreciate. Looking at the females and selection on females instead of males, because we're always talking about that. Thinking about the different ways the neck could be used besides just, it goes tall. <laughs> it's really yeah. interesting. It's also the reason they don't use their forelegs to combat each other is because that would be too hard to balance. If you're a giraffe. So they do it's... use their forelegs to to defend themselves, though. A giraffe can kill a lion with a good kick. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A good kick. So, yeah. Yes. So anyway, uh, so we're staying in the African savanna. I'm going to move on to elephants. Oh, I like elephants. Elephants. They, we know elephants are smart. 
Colorado State University wanted to look at yet another way that elephants are smart. They were looking at wild African elephants and they wanted to see if they have name like calls. And we've talked on this show a lot about how some animal species have kind of names for each other. I think but orca, this is maybe a dolphins really, and whales even. Are, yeah, this is a really happen. particular case though, because dolphins and parrots can call each other by names, but usually that is by imitating the signature call of that person. So hmm. it's almost like a Pokemon thing, right? Like you just, Charizard, Charizard, Squirtle, right? They're like calling their own name. So it's the other way around. It's like, you're yeah. always saying this one catchphrase. So people call you that as your name. That is now one your of, name. One of my favorite things is with different birds, like song sparrows, you can use like the bird apps, like Merlin, and you can play like a song sparrow song and it sings the song. And then the male song sparrows in the spring will be like, oh, I'm going to be in your yard and I'm going to sing that song back to you. And they'll get like super close because they're like, I hear another song sparrow. And never mind that you're not a song sparrow and the sound is coming from you, but I hear that song and it is a threat. So I must sing. Yeah. yeah. So like I, in this case, in that case, identifying another individual mm -hmm. is all about their personal voice. But these but elephants. The name. Yeah. Right. These elephants, research believe, have have actual names much more like we have names so um they use machine learning to confirm that elephant calls contained a name like component that identified the intended recipient and so um they kind of they they came up with this hypothesis based on observing elephants in the wild and so when the researchers played back recorded calls elephants individual elephants would respond affirmatively to calls that were addressed to them by calling back or approaching the speaker. And calls for other elephants received less of an interaction. So if I'm out there calling, Dave, 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 <laughs> Justin, you're not gonna say anything. No, I, go, I'm hey, not, I don't know. Uh, he probably oh, wait, hey, it. what? Yeah, he, he might. There you go. Exactly, so you might, no. but you so definitely here's, pay here's... more attention to your own name or something that sounds like your name. Here's my so, question. Um, here's my yes. question. And I don't know if, the, if it if you got this specific or not. Is the elephant's name the name used for it by one individual elephant or all of the other elephants? So, great question. Like, does Kiki call me uh, Jackson, but you call me Justin, and so I respond to both? No. Right. Okay. This is. Multiple elephants using the same sound. Using for the same elephant. name. Yeah. So they have a, they have, a, they have a, an agreed identification uh, in a audio verbal context for who that uh, represents. Right. Yeah. So that wow. that is where this is really unusual. So they're not wow. mimicking the individual. <clears throat> they are creating arbitrary sonic labels for mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so they were able to like play these songs back and so, see how they would respond. They were confused for a second and then they were like, oh wait, I think someone's calling me. <laughs> they like approached the speaker. <laughs> yes. So you know, the question is arbitrary? Who made it up? Who determined that that is was your the name, name that arbitrary? the group? Yes, absolutely. But some, like my parents decided that that was the name. Some people though, yeah. decide that they are going to, you know, change their name and they go to the government and they fill out a form and they've got a new name and um, people can name themselves. So that's the, I think that's an uh -huh. interesting question that comes. Is it arbitrarily determined by the, the group of elephants or is it um, I have a, indivi I have a individually determined? And I, have a Great mama, question. I have a feeling mama comes up with the name could be uh, they, they are it's, it's mama's kind of calls out for the elephants. individual baby and the baby knows oh that's when, when i need to go back to mama and that becomes the yes i mean bear guess. in mind that's elephants are yeah. extremely communal in how they care for babies as well so yeah. while, while you'll always have a mama as a baby elephant there are lots of other usually female elephants that also are caring for you in the day to day. So it's, that's a really good question. 
who knows um the kind of the next steps of this study which was huge they it was a 14 month long study of intense field work in kenya they followed elephants around they recorded their vocalizations they recorded about 470 distinct calls from 101 unique callers that corresponded with 117 unique receivers so they had 117 names basically that I, they found it through this study. So um, that's they big. Want like, that's much... a good data set. That's not yes. that's not like 15 people in an M fMRI, right? You know, that's right. That's big. Yeah. <laughs> so what they want to do next is de develop more understanding of how complex their language is. So do they also have mm -hmm. names for things like food, water, places, and and ultimately. <laughs> Researchers would love to be able to somehow play a sound that tells elephants that an area is not safe. I so that's that turning fantastic. this into some practical, mm -hmm. yes, conservation kind of action item at the end of this is like, if you can speak elephant, can you tell them, get the heck out of here, there are poachers, or um, there's developments up ahead, go back, or no good food over here, you know, anything like that. So, so th part of this is, ah, we've known for a long time that any animal can basically be told its name and learn to identify that you're talking to it. You can name your cat, your dog, your horse, and then call them, and they'll pay some attention to you, whatever. The ability for any of those animals to use a name to use a name for, for another has not been seen uh, in this way, right? So so this well, so is then- there's, this... there's an extra piece yep, to Justin, which is your cat and your dog know their name, mm -hmm. but do they really? Or do they know that when they hear that sound, it requires their attention because they may get a treat? And that's, and and that that's all I'm asking totally out of it. Totally different thing, all, right? Right, right? And that's all I'm asking out of it, right? Uh, and and it, so we know that we can we can I, have that assignment of name uh, that an animal can recognize as needing the attention, right? Which is sort of what this study is is even showing that they're paying attention to it. But the I, the the level where you have generated name and using it communally is a form of communication. Now every sci-fi sort of movie you've ever seen where there's a first contact, what's the first thing that Whoever is doing the first contact does is like, my name is, and they tell, they like, right, like, I am called human. My name is Justin. What are you and who are you? Like, that's like where we begin the communication in any of these first contact scenarios. If we have unlocked that they are using, assigning verbal communication to a thing, exactly right. It opens up the door to now realizing we may be able to actually speak to the elephants. Individually. Common, individually, if we have a common ground for naming of things, which is the problem with any sort of other animal communications, you can assign names to things and tell your dog to go get the leash. And it will go and maybe, if it's a you know, well-trained enough dog, grab its own leash and bring it to you. Like assigning names for things that we've assigned uh, recognizing things that we've assigned is one one aspect that animals have been shown capable of doing. But assigning their own names to things and using that in communication is such a next level. Oh my god. It implies, I mean, we already we already know cognitive uh, processes, you know, and abilities in elephants that are incredible. Memory, social, you know, all sorts of stuff. But the uh, to go beyond that to understand that if there's if they are assigning each, assigning each other names or even their own names and using that to identify themselves, that moves into a uh, the idea of uh, of having mind, having identity and agency. And it's not just ants, bees, whatever colony or social creatures, social creatures, humans are social mm -hmm. creatures, but the theory of mind where an individual can I, parse itself from the group and the group it, recognizes that that individual is different, but part of the group as well. I mean, that's a huge cognitive step. And if I'm not mistaken, elephants do pretty good in that mirror test. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're with it. 
<sighs> You're very smart. Yeah. Human. Dang it. Smart. Well, I guess that, I guess, well, you know, Blair, I think a long time ago may have uh, decided that we're not, uh, figured out we're not the only sentient creature on the planet. But, oh, really? Uh, yeah. The idea that we can, we can learn the elephant language uh, to some degree now. The question is, do you keep calling the zoo elephant peanuts or do you go every time you give a tour at the zoo and you're talking about your elephant, do you go, this is our female elephant and her husband. I think you would have to, but you'd also probably have to add in a little bit of foot stomping and uh, oh, in that right way because they feel vibration. Through the feet, yeah. that might be part of the communication. Yeah. There's a lot of subtle yeah. communication that, that elephants do through uh, their feet that uh, we've only just started to, to realize. So. Oh, yeah. The, the, the ultrasonic and subsonic sounds that they're able to perceive are also super important for their communication. And it's a question that I have. Of course, I hope that they controlled for it in the study. But like humans stomping around in the savannah, putting down speakers and playing songs and whatever. Yeah. And the elephants didn't know that they were around and doing this. Like, I honestly bet that the elephants were like, yeah, were they calling each other's names or were they saying, what are they up to? <laughs> oh, you would, when, when they do this one, you respond. And when they do this one, you respond. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Too smart. Uh, but I love the uh, this research. Uh, if people are interested in more elephant voices, dot org was uh, involved in creating this elephant ethogram. And then there is also Save the Elephants, which is uh, an organization working to save the elephants. So hopefully, if you mm -hmm. want more, you can find them there. And Blair, I love your um, elephant impressions. Oh, well, my pleasure. No, no. May we continue with Justin? Would you like to duck out right now? Uh, or can we? Can Give we? Give me Justin's Justin first story. Just I've, got last, one story. I've got a last has, story. I've got a last yeah, story. Yeah, he has this one, is, and uh, I have last story. Quick. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah, jump. My last story it. is researchers from John Hopkins University have utilized a new method of air testing, a mobile air testing lab, and they have discovered bad, bad things down in the bayou. The study mm -hmm. is published in Environmental Science and Technology, and it highlights significantly increased cancer risks for residents near ethylene oxide manufacturing and usage facilities uh, along an area of uh, Louisiana, an area of Louisiana known as I think it's called Cancer Alley. Oh, yes, I've heard of this place. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so they so there's a reason they went looking here in the first place, but the uh, basically, there's traditional air monitoring methods that the EPA uses for detecting ethylene oxide that have not been able to capture the full extent of the pollution found in the current study. Part of the reason they, they, they suspect is that the EPA sets up an air monitoring uh, equipment in a set location. Now, depending on how long it's uh, collecting and which way the wind is blowing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it may not find anything significant or it might find something. So what these researchers did was they took a, they created a mobile lab, which allowed them to measure real-time ethylene oxide levels by repeatedly driving a route between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. The measurements revealed up to 40 parts per billion, which is a lot more than the, what is considered the red flag toxicity to human uh, level of 11 parts per billion. So uh, more than three times the red flag levels uh, for, for exposure. The mobile lab consisted of two vans. These vans were equipped with different highly sensitive technologies to measure the ethylene oxide in real time as they drove these routes. During the winter of 2023, the team basically just drove around in a circle, looping along a heavily industrialized route between the to Baton Rouge, collecting air and testing it as they drove. And then the quote here from DiCarlo, who's one of the researchers involved, by driving the same route over and over and over again at different times of day and over the course of an entire month, we are able to build up statistics and get average concentrations throughout the region. The two testing methods agreed really well and provided us with 
confidence in the measurements that we took. They were able to follow airflow and detected concentration amounts of the gas as much as 10 kilometers downwind from the plants. Although facilities uh, everywhere work with ethylene oxide, the facilities in this area are large and they are very concentrated within this southeastern Louisiana area where there's a history of significant environmental issues related to exposures of toxic chemicals, so much so that the area has become known as Cancer Alley. The EPA has recently proposed stricter rules for these emissions, and the study's findings might be able to help them in an enforcing or detecting where their new regulations need to be applied. But this image of where they drove around and they took their measurements and what they are showing in these various counties. And um, of course, this is not like super high resolution for this, uh, this shared thing. Uh, Long-term exposure to 11 parts per trillion is dangerous to health. There is one tiny corner of the infographic that has been shared that is beneath 10. The rest is over 10, 20, 30, and uh, the majority is above 30, I would say. So six. the average- There are places that are was, huge. Yeah. yeah, the average was in that 40. There's places on this map that are 50 and 60, mm-hmm. right? So, so the- <laughs> Uh, and there's housing people living Live in there. this area who are not aware that this invisible gas that is highly toxic is in there. You know, well, know. and one guess what the socioeconomic status is of the grand majority of people in that space. Not, well, it's not Louisiana, wealthy, so you can, that's for sure. What's well, Louisiana, so you can guess it about almost anywhere, but uh, certainly this region. Uh, no, specifically. it's specific when I went there. They talked about Cancer Alley mm-hmm. and specifically that this is where all of like mm-hmm. the least affluent homes end up, right? Is like l- like you you have in in Baton Rouge proper, you have some really nice areas. In New Orleans proper, you have really nice areas. And in this belt in between is where you go if you don't have the means to live in Baton Rouge or in New Orleans. But and you so you end up there with, and you need to commute or whatever. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. And so you end up with a very clear uh, socioeconomic uh, gradient where yeah. Cancer mm-hmm. Alley is. And also there is often a ethnic piece to that as well, sure. um, which is very um, which is part of the reason why, like environmental protections, climate change and all these other things are also a DEI issue is because a lot of the time communities of color are the ones who are getting a lot of these kind of negative impacts of um, environmental issues. So absolutely. Right. And a, then yeah, and tough. then public health and health care and medical bills and all that kind of stuff. And oh, yeah. And then there's politicians who want to do away with the EPA. Like, yeah. I love the yeah. whole like, concept, too, of like, well, we don't like something about water management and private land in Montana, and therefore the entire agency needs to go away, right? Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, that sounds right. there's, there are companies who are costing human health issues, causing human health right. issues, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, with absolute freedom. And that is the world that we will continue to live in without a strong funded EPA. So thank goodness these researchers went and did this uh, look and have given us this insight. And now maybe the EPA can take the baton uh, and, and, and apply the regulations to these industries and maybe do away with them if it need be. Can only if they can't, if you can't clean up, if you can't clean up your mess, if you can't, uh, you'd think, yeah, there is a, you know, there's a, there's a, a whole philosophy of, of business being unregulated and allowed to do its thing because it's only affecting itself. When you are affecting others, you are exacting a cost from the public that you are not paying for in your financial structure of your business that must be accounted for. Mm-hmm. So, 
way of saying it. You can't kill people to make money. It's not. It's not right. There's always accounting. No, no, no. Hey, Kiki, uh, you got more stories? I do. I have two quick stories that I'm going to run through very quickly. I was just opening some images for them so I can jump on through uh, in these two stories. First one up is, hey, you've been places. You know how to get places. You remember them. You have a mental map. And we're like, hey, where do we store all those mental maps in our brains? And we've got the hippocampus that helps us store all that stuff well some researchers just publishing in nature this week talked about mental navigation in the primate entorhinal cortex yes they did uh research on primates and these monkeys in these studies they trained not to go places but to use a joystick and so the monkeys <laughs> learned a digital digital space and so they used a joystick to get around and then the researchers were like well what if you just think about these places that you used to go with your joystick? And so um, they pretty much showed that the monkeys had this amazing response to uh, the situation in which they could time everything down to this millisecond of when they would normally have moved the joystick around and been in certain contextual situations in the digital space, the monkeys were then, uh, their neurons in an area of the brain, the entorhinal cortex, which is right near the hippocampus, so it's all in there in the same kind of space, the neurons were activated in the same way, at the same time, in the entorhinal cortex, at, when they were thinking about using the joystick as when they actually were using the joystick. So they basically showed it in the screen, but took the joystick away. Is that what they did? Yeah. But okay. then they took the screen away. Then they took the screen away and the, uh, the monkeys had to, were visualizing it. And they showed oh. that the monkeys were visualizing it very well on their own. They're like, Hey, I started oh. here. Well, okay. I'm going to go there next. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and all of those vector vector based cues so like three three dimensional space neurons mm -hmm. basically orientation neurons were in play at the time so like when you're playing a video game counter strike or world of warcraft or whatever and you're do, 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 your integral cortex if you're imagining it outside of the gameplay it's actually happening in there like there's a map so it's like you're there is what you're mm -hmm. saying yeah there's it a, feels there. like you're in the yeah. game mm -hmm. So I, yeah, that's I, cool. It's in your brain, a, man. What is it? What's the kind of thing where you you dream, but you're like aware of the thing in the dream? What's lucid dreaming. Yes. Lucid yeah. dream. So I'm a very lucid dreamer. Like when I'm dreaming, I'm very aware that I'm dreaming that I'm in a dream. Uh, and my brain uses maps of locations mm -hmm. for dreams. Like my grandparents' house is a common theme. Regardless of what's going on, I could be in a spaceship and the spaceship is flying and I realize like, oh, there's a room to the spaceship over here and one over here and there's a bathroom. Oh, I think this is actually my grandparents' house that has been turned into a spaceship for the use of this dream. Like it happens constantly. My, my, my dreams use that data, access that data for mapping to create the environment for the dream. Uh, almost, almost to the point where I spend a lot of times in my dreams trying to pinpoint what uh, structure <laughs> this is uh, based yeah. on. And you usually can, usually can find it pretty quickly. But it's interesting, too, because in, uh, there ha there's, uh, we were talking about mapping from, from, from video games. I've done that before, too. Like, wow, what is this place? Oh, this is a level in Fallout 3 or whatever. Like, I know what this building, this is from a video game I played. Because that, that mental mapping also is working uh to uh, in a virtual re realm to create that map so and that i think that's the that's the cool thing is that our brains don't know real space from virtual space and so yeah. space is, is space brain, and maps are being created and we got to keep going brain, and the it's brain so is a cool. virtual space it is a virtual space it is responsive yeah. to space and our existence within it it is our embodied brain right and yeah. uh it's What's I think the big thing about this is that this is a big step forward in determining the neurons that are involved in the mapping of uh, space 
in our brains and, and how they become active. And basically when you're uh, mental mapping, when you're ma- building memory castles, all that stuff, this part of the brain is involved. Last study, uh, again, related to primates, baby baboons, left or right-handed, Blair? <gasps> left. <laughs> Actually, researchers have discovered that baboons tend to be very right-handed, very similar. Really? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of primates are left. Yep. These are, uh, they, they are mostly right-handed. These researchers at the CNRS, they, uh, we're able to, these French researchers, we're studying the baby baboons and the neuroanatomy of their brains. And they could predict based on how the brains were asymmetrying, what they mm-hmm. called, uh, that just like human babies, these newborn baboons, 70% of them at least, had early asymmetry in the planum temporal. It's an area related to language in humans. It's larger in the left brain hemisphere. Left Which is the right, right hand. hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was, uh, this is how it worked in these baboons. And in Nature Communications, they have just published this study. And uh, they've shown that they are able to correlate the difference in brain structure and symmetry after birth, these are live baboons. They just did uh, neuroimaging. Um, and then they could predict, based on modeling, which hand these baboons were going to use. And some of the baboons did not have as much asymmetry as the others. And they were the ones who were like, well, you know, I might be ambidextrous. And they would use both hands or whatever. Um, so there was differentiation similar to humans in these baboons um i'm a little bit i'm a little bit afraid that my youngest uh boys is a freak <laughs> he seems to be he seems to favor the left for a lot of things he's a bit ambidextrous still but he's really favors that left so so i think my little one is left-handed awesome mm-hmm. it's wonderful it's a gift yeah, yeah. it's a total a couple, wild. A couple of freaky Your children brains work different yeah, oh, wow. I didn't realize I was I wasn't actually showing this picture the whole time because I oh. turned off automatic screen sharing earlier tonight. Um, um, but yeah, they were able to really uh, see the the difference between the newborns and the juveniles and uh, the biases and how similar they were to human infants, which was you know fairly similar actually, different proportions overall, but similar trend. And this is one of the first times that we have been able to go, oh my gosh, wait a minute. We thought humans were super special with our handedness and that was language ability. And oh my gosh, and that's what it's, but maybe it came from our ancestors because now we're seeing that this is a developmental thing in the bamboos as well. So we're not special. Everyone chill. (laughs) You're special. Elephants have names. Baboons have handedness. Get over yours. It's so great. I love these little handed little little baboons with their their hands and what they're going to do but right now if i had a baboon baby baboon well no actually i don't want a baby baboon that probably would not be nice um no nope you want to leave them with their mothers and let that happen all on its own um but i think that you know handedness is great for doing things like going bye we have finished all of our shows for the night haven't we ambidextrously yeah, communicatively, right-handed, left-handed, all of it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We are out of here. We got to head on out. And I really want to thank you for listening tonight. I just love that you're here with us in the chat rooms, everyone watching live. And also, if you're not watching live, thank you for watching later. Uh, Fada, thank you for your help on show notes and social media. Rachel, thank you for editing the show. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Gord, Arnlor, all others who help to upkeep the kindness of our chat rooms. Thank you for what you do. If you are excited about uh, talking in our Discord, you can also look at us on Patreon. Patreon, And that happens when you are a Patreon sponsor. So become a patron. And I will say your name somewhat like this. 
variably depending on the time of the month. Alan Viola, Aaron Anathema, Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Bob Coles, Kent Northout, George Kors, P.R. Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Chris Wozniak, Vegard Chefstad, Donegan Styles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, P.I.G., Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul, Ronovich, Kevin Ridden, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Marques and Plus, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, G. Burton Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Ardiam, Greg Briggs, Get Out of the Dominican Republic, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Lon Makes, EO, Ed Mishkan, Aaron, Luthen, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele. Thank you all. Darn it. I see I'm at the end of the list. I read them all just like that. I, this is, I need to change that setting again. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, just like these wonderful people, Head over to twist.org, click on the Patreon link and choose your level of support. $10 or more a month gets you to this level, uh, but any level will probably get you into the Discord. Uh, we'll be back again next week, right? At 8 p.m. Pacific time, Wednesday, Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European time, broadcasting live from Twitch, the YouTube, the Facebooks, the wherever you got, we're probably there. Now, Blair, you do this part. You got it. Want to listen to us as a podcast? Just search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to the stories will be available on our website, www.twis.org. It's how many W's is that? Three? It's, I think we it love was your three. Feedback. Sometimes it might be four. <laughs> If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address or a suggestion for us uh, for an interview, please let us know on one of our social media accounts or send us an email. Just be sure to put twist T W I S in the subject line, or you know what? I'm going to encapsulate it in um, a nice gel capsule and I'm going to sell it as a supplement on the street corner. Oh God, no, you don't know where that's going to go. <laughs> We look forward to having these science discussions with you again next week. And if you've learned anything from the show, do remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.